in ideas that you could potentially try with your own family to try and reduce how much food you might be wasting. Um, but before we get started, since we have a small group, it would be great to go around and have everybody introduce yourself. And if you could share what food your household wastes the most and why. So I'm going to, I'll go first and then I'll go call on everybody one on one, one by one. Um, but my name is Marielle. Um, <laughs> The food that I waste the most, I think, is actually leftover curry because for whatever reason, I always make too much of it. I make these massive pots of curry and I really don't like eating leftover curry for whatever reason. So I always waste that. That's my one thing. I don't know what it is. Um, so I'm just going to, I guess, call on you guys one on one, one by one, if you don't mind, and you can unmute yourselves and share. Um, so Corey, would you mind going first? Aloha. Uh, yes, I'm right there with you, Marielle. I think we probably waste leftovers of any kind, really. It usually just whatever doesn't turn out to be so appetizing as to um, tempt us to eat it the next day. <laughs> so nothing in particular necessarily. Great. Thanks, Corey. Um, how about candy? Or, or someone whose name I'm sorry, says candy. I had to, um, to unmute it. Um, what was the question? I just joined, I'm sorry. Sure, we're asking what food you waste the most in your household and why. Oh my gosh, it's so dumb, but um, probably salad that my husband will buy like a bag of salad. And, um, and then, you know, with good intentions. And, I do vermiculture, so I um, try to compost everything in my worm bin, but that usually gets thrown out because it gets found and it's all slimy and gross and stinky and, you know, and sealed in plastic. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a tough one. Even despite your best intentions, that's what happens. Um, mm -hmm. All right, Harry. Could you share with us what you waste the most in your house? Um, yeah, probably, um, yeah, same thing, salad. I usually make too much. Uh, usually my eyes are bigger than my stomach. And, uh, but I usually end up composting it. Great. Yeah. Um, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer, you're still muted. Sorry, having trouble. And I usually use my cell phone for this, so. Oh yeah, that, that makes it tougher. <laughs> <laughs> but I have such slow internet. I, I would agree, like lettuce, you know? Or just vegetables in general, because they, they'll go bad before you can get to them. I think that's really my only issue with food waste. Um, and I don't feel too terrible about it because I can compost it. So it's like, <laughs> so, hmm. yeah. I'm seeing some patterns here. This is so interesting. Um, Krisha, could you share with us what you waste in your household? Hi. Um, I think definitely salads but I try not to eat salad so I don't waste it too much. <laughs> um, yeah, like I think um, celery, actually. I waste mm. celery, a lot of celery, because I never can eat as fast as the entire thing. Yeah, actually celery. <laughs> so interesting. Um, London, how about you? Okay, um, after careful thought and consideration, we have decided it's the nuts and berries in the back of the cabinet that get wasted. <laughs> ah, very healthy eaters, this crowd. <laughs> Melody, how about you? Uh, I just say hi to everybody, this is fun. <laughs> I had a baby Tano. <laughs> um, I'd like to say 
yeah, I think we're pretty good with leftovers because we're pretty good with eating it for lunch afterwards. I'm going to blame my kids <laughs> for maybe being the most with the wasting of the food because like right now they're, you know, like helping themselves in the fridge and they're loving pouring themselves a bowl of cereal, but then they fill it too much and they don't eat the leftovers. But then I tend not to feel so guilty with our leftovers with our throwing away of food because we have chickens and sometimes we have pigs and I just, ah, they'll enjoy it. So, but I, but I should probably feel more guilty. <laughs> Okay. Yes, great. Um, let's see, who do we have? Uh, Mon Monica, did you go? Um, so I also always will find some random vegetable in the bottom of the veggie drawer. Um, and then the other thing, which is really random, is like we're trying to get better about food waste. So I've been cooking, I've been like saving my, um, like cooking meat juice in like these jars in my fridge. And then I just don't do anything with them. And then they just like pile up in the fridge. And I know that's really random, but I've got like chicken juice in this one and like pork fat in this one. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with any of it. You guys sound so similar to me. This is so funny. Um, is this, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this name. San? S A N A. It's Sana. Sana. Um, I have to say that just from cooking, like I live alone now, but I it's so hard for me to cook like a portion. So soups is my thing because I love soup, and I'm like ah, da 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 da, and I'm pretty soon I'm like, wow, I've got a lot of soup. <laughs> so so I try I try to eat it because I I'll just keep eating it, and then I end up freezing it. But then once in a while it's something that doesn't freeze well, so then I have to get rid of it which makes me sad mm. yeah that's a tough one um tara how about you um it's if you had asked me a couple months ago it was bacon grease but we have since repurposed that for dog treats so that doesn't get wasted anymore um so i would say now like most of us, uh, the greens, the leafy greens, we just don't eat them fast enough. Um, been better since we've gotten a CSA and we don't have to buy like bulk greens. We get them fresh and local. And I would also say rice, similar to your curry situation. My husband makes the rice and I don't eat a lot. And so he always over makes rice with the best intentions to do fried rice the next day and it doesn't happen. <laughs> yep that literally like just happened to us last night <laughs> great well okay thanks so much for sharing everybody so this is just so interesting i was saying um it's always i like to do that at the beginning because every group is totally different so i think you guys can tell that you guys are kind of on another level from the people that i'm usually talking to about this you guys are like wasting really healthy things or things that are already byproducts. So it sounds like you guys are doing pretty well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen or am I sharing my screen? Here we go. Um, let's see. Is it allowing you to, Marielle? Yes, I think so. Is that working now? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, you can see your view or my view? We can see your view, the timer and next slide. Please. Okay. How about now? There we go. Perfect. Okay, we got this working. So I was saying thank you guys so much for coming. This is actually my first webinar. So um, this is a really good experience for me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Marielle and I'm an extension agent with the University of Hawaii. And we're going to be talking about family food waste prevention here in Hawaii. And we all know that this is a really challenging time. And a lot of us, as we were just talking about, we're experiencing some major changes in our food habits right now. Um, but food waste and prevention is still really important, especially right now when things like overpurchasing and hoarding are becoming an issue, not just for consumers, but also for food supply chains. So I just wanted to thank you all again for coming and joining us for this webinar because it really shows your commitment to zero waste even during these times. So thank you for that. 
So thanks everybody for sharing your most wasted foods. I really like that exercise because it really shows that reducing food waste takes practice and it takes intention. You know, every family and person is going to have a different situation. Um, eating is so personal. So it really helps to pay attention to what you waste and see if there are small changes that you can make to improve that. So after this webinar, what I would really like you to come away with is maybe just one idea about how you or your family could waste less of that food that you were talking about. So for me and my leftover stew or my curry, um, I could freeze the leftovers right after I finish cooking it because I know that it's going to go to waste if I don't. So that's just one thing that I could try. Um, if you guys, it sounds like you might be wasting a lot of fruits or vegetables, you might try switching a little to more frozen fruits or vegetables is what I do because I also waste a lot of those things. Um, but yeah, so just coming up with these little steps that you can take, um, whatever makes sense for your family, I just encourage you to think about how you can move in that direction incrementally, um, but not be too hard on yourselves at the same time. You guys are all doing great and you're already here. So you're ahead of the curve. You're being very proactive. So just to start with a few statistics, um, the, the last study that was done on this in Hawaii was in 2015 and they estimated that here in the state, more than a quarter of the available food um, yeah, let me hide this. A quarter of the available food supply in Hawaii is discarded every year. So that is a value of about a billion dollars. For here in Hawaii, we pretty much, we waste less food per person than people on the mainland, but it actually costs us more because we have higher food prices. So it adds up to about $800 per person each year. So the average family of four wastes almost $2,800 of food. I know that you guys aren't the average family, so it's probably way less for you guys, but um, that is the average. It really adds up. Usually we waste food because we don't have enough time. You know, food waste isn't always a priority. We don't always do a great job at planning and managing our food purchases or our food storage and reuse. You know, right now is a great example. As we were talking about, you know, we're worrying about different things. We're worrying about our safety and our health or paying the bills or the food supply itself. You know, we're all adapting to cooking more at home and grocery shopping less. So there are just all these changes that are happening right now in the way that we're buying and consuming food. So trying to avoid food waste just doesn't always feel important. Um, but on an individual level, level, there are really a lot of different reasons that we end up wasting food. It sounds like with you guys, there's a theme here that you guys buy a lot of fruits and vegetables because you're trying to be healthy. Um, sometimes, especially right now, we might buy too much of one food because we're trying to get better value, like when you go to Costco and get a huge container of something. Um, and right now too, you might be worrying about the store running out. So you might be over-purchasing a little bit. Um, I also heard, there was mention of being used to cooking larger batches of food. You know, if you're the kind of person who's used to cooking for a lot of diff a lot of people, right now you might be cooking too much and not have a good way to get that extra food to neighbors or friends so that they can use it. So it's really important to be thinking about these reasons that you're wasting certain foods right now, because that's just going to be the key to finding a strategy that will be able to improve that. So why families should prevent food waste? The first reason is really simple. Avoiding waste saves your family money. Um, you know, as you can see, depending on your family's habits, you have the potential to save hundreds or even thousands of dollars from buying less food if you are able to reduce that waste. But there are also really important environmental benefits to reduced food waste. You know, we're on a really small island. We have limited space to store our trash and food is a significant portion of that waste. I'm sure you guys already know that. So less food going into our landfills means we don't require as much landfill space for our garbage. And food waste and landfills also contributes to climate change because it releases methane, which is a really harmful greenhouse gas. It's actually 25 times as potent 
as carbon dioxide at trapping heat in the atmosphere. Um, the other reason to avoid food waste is resource conservation. So if you're making a meal and you end up throwing that away, you're wasting everything that was used to get that food to your plate. So food comes from farms that use fertilizers and feed and water and other inputs. You know, they have tractors and workers planting, harvesting, packing the food. Then it has to get transported to a store, prepared and cooked and served to you. And if you end up throwing it away, it has to be transported to the landfill. So all of those steps involve resources that are also wasted whenever that food is wasted. But families can prevent food waste. The EPA has four recommendations that they break it down to for consumers to reduce their food waste. There's smart shopping, which is meal plans and shopping lists. Smart prep, preparing fresh food right when you get home from the store. Start, smart storage, which is learning to store different foods so they last longer. Um, and smart saving, which is having a zone in your fridge that's um, an eat first area. So you remember to eat food before it spoils. Um, but every family's different, like I said. So just remember that all of these ideas are just ideas and it's, it's really up to you guys to figure out what strategies are gonna work for you. And it does take practice. Um, so shopping menu planning is shown to reduce food waste. Uh, it's also a great way for family members to get involved. They can help you make a menu each week before you go shopping. If your kids are too young to plan a menu themselves, you can ask them for suggestions every week um, and try to use at least one of their ideas so they get to feel like they're involved and have some ownership. Kids can also help you find recipes online or in cookbooks. Um, and shopping lists are really important, especially right now. They help you plan ahead um, they remind you to take inventory of what you already have on hand. Um, so I've, I'm finding that right now they're really important to make sure I'm only buying what I need and not going for impulse purchases when I'm in the store because I'm freaking out a little bit. Because once you get to the store, it can get a little intense, especially right now. So smart prep. This is a really hard one to keep up, but it's totally worth it if you are able to do it. So preparing fresh food right when you get home from the store. That means like washing and chopping up fruits and vegetables and storing them in the fridge until you're ready to use them with the exception of soft fruits like berries because those can rot easily. But it just makes it so much easier to cook meals and also to have healthy snacks on hand. So that's especially important right now because everybody's at home all day it's really tempting to reach for junk food. So having pre-prepped fruits and vegetables is, a, is an easy way to make sure you're snacking on better foods. Um, so as you can see in this photo, when you're storing food, you really want to use clear airtight containers. Food safety is the top priority when you're talking about leftovers. So you wanna make sure that you can cool your food down quickly as well as see really clearly what's in each container. Um, for produce and other foods, it also helps to know the proper storage method for different foods. I use the Food Keeper app, which I think comes actually out of the FDA, and they offer a lot of useful information about food storage and also food safety. They have like push notifications when there's food recalls and stuff like that, which is great. Um, I would just keep in mind, we are in a tropical environment so most of the recommendations about food storage might be basing that on a different temperature than you have in your house. So that's why it's really important to make the most of your fridge and your freezer. Uh, for example, I always store my bread in the fridge or the freezer, and I actually also keep my potatoes in the fridge. That's probably not necessarily the typical recommendation for storage, but that's what I've found works for my climate and my situation. It's also really important to keep your fridge and freezer clean so you don't forget about food. That's such a big thing. Um, you also wanna make sure you have space in your freezer for leftovers so it's really easy to remember to do that. You can make an eat first sign to go on your fridge shelf to remind you to eat foods that'll go bad soon. And that's actually a great project you can do with your kids. Um, 
you can, they can either color in or decorate a strip of paper that says eat first. And then you use tape to laminate it and you can stick it to a shelf in your fridge. Um, and if you have kids, you might want to make that shelf low down so that the kids can reach it um, so that they can be eating those foods. So I think that probably most of you have dealt with some issues with cakey and food waste. It's a really, it's a challenging issue to address. Um, there's a whole different set of issues with kids and food waste. So the first thing that I'd like to remind folks is that children's serving sizes and dietary requirements are a lot smaller than for adults. So they really don't need adult sized servings. Um, if you're serving your kids food, you can start small and I would encourage them to ask for seconds if they need it. If they do serve themselves, you can encourage them to give themselves smaller portions. And actually you can use smaller serving utensils as kind of a trick to help them serve themselves less if it's a problem that they're always over serving. Slicing snacks can be helpful too. There was actually a Cornell study that found that kids who were eating sliced snacks found them more appealing and were more likely to eat them. If, the, if your kids are old enough or if you have like a kitchen knife set that's appropriate for kids and they can help prepare the snacks, that can actually help them uh, be more likely to eat that food as well. That could be a really good strategy to use with foods that are expensive and wasted very often like fruits and vegetables. So I used to waste a lot of fruit and I have switched almost entirely to frozen fruit. It can be a really great refreshing snack when it's hot outside. You can add it to oatmeal, yogurt, cereal, or pancakes. You can also use extra frozen or fresh fruit. Um, you can cook it into like a compote that you can use as a topping for breakfast foods or dessert foods. And then of course you can make smoothies with them. Uh, and you can save leftover smoothies in ice cube trays or make smoothie popsicles. Um, my personal favorite is frozen blueberries. I found that they're a great alternative to fresh fruit. Um, I put them in my cereal, my yogurt. I have them, you know, for dessert. They're small enough because they, they stay soft even when they're frozen. So you can actually eat them straight from the freezer as a snack. Um, so that's my little tip. Frozen vegetables are a great way to add very quick nutrition to meals and they, they last for months in your freezer. So I always keep a bag of frozen mixed vegetables in my freezer to add to pasta sauces. I add it to eggs, soups and stews. Um, I also like to keep frozen greens um, in my freezer that I can add to my meals to just throw in some quick nutrition, even something like mac and cheese. It's a really good habit to establish a weekly leftovers night with your kids if you have them to use up the food that will spoil soon. Um, you can come up with fun names for it like yo-yo -no night, which is you're on your own. Um, you can also cook different meals that use leftover food like stir fry or fried rice or frittatas. Um, and actually, if you guys, oh yeah. <laughs> Um, if you guys want to use the chat box and just throw a few of your ideas for what foods you like to cook with leftovers. I know that fried rice is a really popular one. Um, frittatas is something that I've heard a lot. Veggie burgers actually are something that I've really gotten into or like black bean burgers are a great way to use up leftover beans. Um, Let's see, Monica asks, does pre-cutting veggies make them go bad quicker or no? I think that it depends what you're dealing with. Um, I wouldn't cut up things that you're not going to use probably in the next week or so. Um, because for example, I'm thinking like carrots. Carrots will last for a really long time in the fridge whole. If you chop them up and there's a lot of moisture in the bag, that could make them go bad a little sooner. Um, but if you're doing it on like a weekly or bi-weekly basis, it might work. Oh, kitchen sink salads. Yeah, salads. I, I always forget about salads. Salads are a great way to use up leftover food. Meatloaf. Lean out of the fridge meatloaf. 
Oh, clean out of the fridge meatloaf. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, that's a good way to throw a lot of veggies into one place if you're trying to use those up. Um, yeah, feel free to keep adding ideas. I always like hearing about what people like to make with their leftovers. If you're like me, you're not crazy about reheating the meal you had the day before. So coming up with meals that you can throw together with leftovers is a good way to change the flavors a little bit. Oh, put pos oh, I put everything into the meatloaf. Oh, my favorite thing I actually that I like to make with leftovers is if I have stale tortilla chips, I make this Mexican dish called migas, where you soak crushed tortilla chips in egg. And then you fry it up with salsa and spices on the stove and you can add beans and vegetables into it too. Looks like fried rice is, is another popular one. Oh, veggie patties with leftover sweet potato. I never even thought about that. That's a great one. You guys are full of good ideas. And it sounds like we have some worm, worm aficionados in the chat today. Um, but if you haven't already, starting a worm bin is a super easy, kid-friendly way to turn your food scraps into great nutrient-rich compost that is good for your plants. Um, you know, all you really need is a bin with some holes drilled into it, newspaper, a spray bottle, and a handful of worms. And since you're part of this group, if you don't already have a worm bin, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's happy to give you a handful of worms to get started. Um, they're also great because they don't require much space. So even if you have an apartment, that's an option. Um, oh, the Fridge Pal app was recommended in the chat. That might be another good way. Oh, Candy has worms for Kona side. Good to know. Great, you guys are so on top of it. So working with your family to prevent food waste will really help everyone to learn to become more aware of your own habits. And as you have probably seen through some of the work of your colleagues, Cakey make really great food waste ambassadors. Not everybody wants to hear an adult talk to them about why they shouldn't be wasting food, but kids are an, an awesome way to get that message out there. Um, there are also lots lots of opportunities that you can get involved in different community or school composting or zero waste projects. Um, you guys might have heard of Maona Community Garden is doing a community composting project. Here in Hamakua, we have Michael Piron who does a compost service um, and picks up compost from Hamakua Harvest. So if you don't have your own composting projects going on at your place, there are lots of options as well. Um, they have to be red wrigglers. Great, so thanks so much you guys for being here and I'd love to take your questions. I'll stop sharing my screen so we can see each other again. Um, so I know that you guys are, are just on another level. So I'd love to hear if you have any other suggestions that you have found that work for what you find to be your own issues for someone who's very aware of waste already and taking a lot of steps. Um, it sounds like you guys have a lot of options for composting. And one of the things I'd wonder is, do you sometimes think maybe that causes you to not worry as much about food waste because you feel like it's going somewhere and it's not getting fully wasted so you don't have to worry about it as much you know i think salad is a great example of that i'm guilty of it too you know i just don't think i don't think twice about having leftover salad because i know i can just toss it outside and it'll decompose um rather than being more mindful so anybody have any suggestions for me, oh, sorry, go ahead, Senna. Yeah. You go. No, I was going to say that I'm sure you guys know this too, though. Like the biggest danger in the fridge is not having a see through container. Because it, if it's, you can't see through, if you don't know what's in there, you, you won't even take the time if you're in a hurry to like open it up. It's like, I don't know, <laughs> and move on to the next. So I use all glass now, but just to see through it, I know makes a difference for me. Mm, absolutely. Visibility is, is so huge. It's such a simple concept, but it makes all the difference. I think that's the issue a lot of times with freezers as well, you know, because we don't always open up our freezer and really take inventory. 
I'm stuck in my tutu style of whatever container I have. Is it sour cream or is it leftover cauliflower? You might not know until you open it. <laughs> oh, I never even thought about that. The reusing <laughs> containers. Yeah. Huh. How do you even get around that? that? One thing that kind of affects what I buy is I'm trying to like reduce packaging waste. And so um, that kind of really affects my food waste sometimes too. Um, Sometimes it's like, I found it's better to not have lettuce. It's better to not have a lot of plastic stuff in, or to have stuff in plastic bags. I feel like the plastic bags kind of make some things go worse and some things are better in the plastic. So kind of food, food storage is big, but also trying to reduce the packaging waste. And so there's all this like pressure on my food shopping and it has to like do, it has to like check all these boxes and, mm. um, Right now, I've totally eased up on that because of the pandemic and stuff. I haven't even been bringing my own produce bags, which is like killing me. But um, I'm going to sign up for a CSA. So. Yeah, I loved that idea. It never even occurred to me that a CSA could help reduce the waste associated with your purchases, um, both in the sense that it's reducing the packaging and it's, it's pre-portioned for you already. So there's less likelihood that you're going to be over-purchasing. So For me, I have found that the CSA takes a lot of that pressure off of like creating the shopping list because it's in front of you. Your choices are a little bit more limited, like not limited that you can't get a variety of vegetables, but I don't have four different types of the same vegetable. It's like, would you like this vegetable? Yes or no. And so it's helped me essentially shop from home without having to worry when I get to the store and start worrying about the packaging and the type and I've I've noticed our food waste has gone down dramatically since I signed up for a CSA and everything's pre-proportioned so I don't have to worry about how much I'm grabbing. Yeah and I imagine it makes menu planning a little easier too because you <laughs> you know you just have what you have. I was curious when you get your food Tara from the CSA is it in a lot of packaging or is it come pretty unpackaged? comes so for one of the CSAs that I do it comes in a cardboard box and then like tomatoes mushrooms things that need to be like somewhat contained are in a paper bag and then things that are really wet that could potentially transfer are in a sustainable island compostable bags which we know aren't that compostable for the home composter but I still put them in there and then just sort through chunks every once in a while um, and then my other CSA is from the people who own Sustainable Island Products. So everything that's, that it comes in is also compostable, maybe not at a home compost mm -hmm. level, but I reuse them for like starting fruits and vegetables and stuff. It's not actual plastic, it's plant-based plastic. So it's better. It's not a great solution, but it's better. And that's with um, adaptation is the CSA you're looking at using? Adaptations, I do one week and then I do EO Farms Hawaii the other week. Okay. Um, and it's one better, better greens. <laughs> okay. Thank you. But both are really yeah. cognizant of less packaging waste, which is really nice. They only package what they truly have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I think, um, I forget who was saying it, but yeah, I think that there are definitely some things which benefit from plastic and others which really don't. Um, so I've definitely found that for myself is a little bit of trial and error and figuring out where packaging is helpful or, or not. So I do have a question for you, Mariel. Um, when you're talking about like planning meals and things like that i'm sure you hear a lot that like i just don't have time to do that hopefully it's not a problem right now for most people um but what do you say to people that say i just don't have time to plan to reduce my waste well right now i think is a great time to start that if you don't because i think for safety reasons it makes sense to plan ahead right now you know, you're trying to reduce the number of trips you have to make to the grocery store. You're trying to choose things that are going to last you till your next trip. Um, you know, you might not have as much money, that sort of thing. And even the physical 
way you move through the grocery store. I see now, I think Walmart is even making their, uh, their aisles one way. So I think that there's some, there's, there's reasons that you would want to have a clear design of that list so that you can move strategically through the grocery store right now. Um, again, you know, that's not important to everybody. If it's possible to have your family help you with that process, that's a great way to kind of release some of the burden. Um, when I was growing up, once we were all of a, a decent age, we had to just come up with a list of, I think it was four or five meals. Maybe it was even just four. We didn't have to do any research. We didn't have to do any grocery shopping. All we literally had to do was name four meals if it was our turn that week. And then my mom would figure out, you know, how to make that happen. And I think sometimes that's the issue is there's like a bit of a mental block and people thinking like, I have to start from like, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, what do I already have? And, and the process of thinking through it is a little daunting. Um, so that's a place where other people's input can help move that along. So like if somebody else makes the decision, this person actually does the shopping and cooking kind of thing. So I don't know if that's something that works for people based on their division of labor in their households, but um, if you can have input from others that that can make a difference. Um, and then things like CSAs or basically things that force you to have a set of, of foods that you're choosing from to make your meals. Um, so that might be another thing is if people are able to just take inventory before they go to the store, that at least will jumpstart that process of them thinking about, okay, what do I have on hand? As they're shopping in the store, they'll be thinking about the meals they're creating rather than just being there looking at the food and kind of going off of instinct or impulse. Um, so, you know, I think it's a process. It would be unreasonable to think that somebody who has never planned a meal in their life is suddenly going to start planning ahead a week or two weeks. My brother-in-law, for example, he only ever used to buy the foods to make the meal that night. And this is a whole new world for him, you know? Um, but I think that shopping lists actually are a good way to kind of get, you know, your way into that world. Actually, right now I'm working on a CTAR publication that's a shelter in place food shopping list. So, it's just a quick list of non-perishables as well as longer lasting produce. So you could kind of go through that and be like, oh, okay, these are the things here that I need and I know that I can build a menu around those things. Um, so yeah, incremental steps. So what my family or what I've been trying to do is getting much better at meal planning, which is really overwhelming for me, but I pick three meals. So like before the pandemic, I would pick three meals and I would look up the, the ingredients list and I would look at my pantry and I would just go buy everything for those three meals. Plus like some other like salad stuff, like in between. And so at least that would get me through like half the week. Plus like lunch would be the leftovers from the meal and, um, and then like stretch it like a little bit more, a little bit more. And then maybe you can get all the food for a week. And then the other point I wanted to bring up is, but during these times you can like make your list and then go to the store and like, it's not there. And you're like, oh, okay. So then you have to buy what you can. And so it's just something that's a little bit different about the times that we're living in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do think, you know, stocking your pantry maybe is helpful in that sense too, because if you have things already on hand, it's a lot easier Versus if, like you say, you know, if you have to get all the ingredients for a meal and they don't have one thing, that's going to throw you off. Um, so folks who have well-stocked pantries probably have a head start here. And like investing in spices, it's like expensive at first, but if you like buy all your spices to make Indian food and all your spices to make Italian food, then it's like you can just throw stuff together down the line. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And hopefully since, you know, we are seeing so much more home cooking, this, you know, home cooking is really a pathway to all of these other experiences is if you're used to getting your food as takeout or restaurants, this is this may be some of the first times that you're having to look up recipes or 
plan ahead for your shopping and things like that, but it's a great opportunity. Um, and I think actually you guys have been putting out a lot of great information on your social media um, in terms of, you know, people need help with the, the changing habits um, for their families and their homes right now and information and easy recipes and techniques are going to help them get there. So that's great. I made four meals out of one Costco chicken. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you guys are expert level. <laughs> but it's still, it comes in plastic. But, you know, um, it was, my husband was there super early morning and texted me and I said, oh, yeah, you know, grab a rotisserie chicken. I don't do that all the time. But, you know, um, for $5, that's, you know, if you were a family, I mean, you can hardly buy a chicken and, and make it for less. Um, but also having dogs, um, not a lot of food goes to waste, but they're kind of fat now. So, <laughs> so that's the problem. But um, the worms, I have my own worm bin. I've been doing it for, gosh, almost 20 years now. Um, be careful. Don't go out in the yard and just dig up worms. You have to have red regulars. They're a special worm. Um, if you, you dig up a, you know, you put in night crawlers or some kind of other worm, you'll just end up with a big bin of stinky yuck. So, um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. glad to hear that you have worms to share because I actually have been hearing that we needed a source for worms on the, wet si on the west side. So I'm happy to hear that. Oh, I would love for everyone to know that I'm their source for, of worms on the west side. <laughs> Worms, not COVID, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, the worm bin, you know, you mine is right outside. I use a, a big um, Rubbermaid trash can. I just drill holes in the bottom of it, put it on a couple blocks um, on top of a, a screen, and then I have a kitty litter um, pan underneath it so that any of the juice or whatever that goes, that's actually like a... Um, you know, that's a fertilizer, but you have to mix that with water. Um, but now our landfill will not take paper. So we have a shredder at work, and I try to shred just about everything. And if I shred the paper and put it in my bin, um, it usually takes them a couple of weeks, but they, they will uh, compost almost all of it. So... Every once in a while when I'm going through it, I'll find, you know, like a little piece of foil or a little piece of a tea bag or something that, that they, for some reason, didn't. Um, but they will, it, you have to keep it dark. Um, I get, um, it's like silk fabric from the fabric store. I can't remember what they call it. It's like what they use on wedding dresses. Um, but insects can't go through there but you you have to be able to um, have the worms be able to breathe so they like being in a dark place I drill holes in the top and then put that cloth in between and <clears throat> if you don't do that you will end up with some you know opening your bin and finding a lot of really scary spiders which don't bother me but they bother other people so so what um, you're saying is when I just threw the worms into my compost, that was the wrong way to do it? Uh, yeah, because um, they're not native either. So worms can cause a problem in some landscapes. But you live in an urban area where they've probably already been introduced and they're everywhere and it probably doesn't matter. But like for me, I live in a, a place where there's a lot of agriculture. So, you know, I'm, um, I don't, I use, I use it for you know some of the plants and things like that but um it's uh but it's a great way to um if you're doing it correctly it won't smell and and um just keep it in a shady spot and yeah it's um it's wonderful and then of course if you have chickens you can see them <laughs> Actually, Candy, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably send you an email soon here because I'm planning on putting together a webinar on or a little video on making worm bid for 4-Hers. So I was oh. hoping to find somebody who would help me do that. And I know you guys have some worm experts in your midst, so I might tap into that. Thank you. Yeah, for sharing. That's really great.
Also, I, I know it's kind of a waste, but um, lemon peels and eggshells are really good for um, cleaning your garbage disposal um, mechanism. <laughs> so I usually put eggshells in the worm bin, but every once in a while I'll throw, throw them in. Um, ice cubes, a lemon peel, and a couple eggshells um, will sharpen and kind of clean it. That's interesting. Actually, what I like, I don't know if this is good or not, but I use lemons, like if after I've squeezed a lemon half, I use it to clean my sink because it gets the gunk off the bottom and the sides really well. So that's my reuse. Oh, Corey had to head out for baby bath time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed it, Marielle. What do you use? Um, like a, a, a half lemon after I've squeezed the juice out, I use it to like clean my, the inside of my sink. Nice. You guys have some great ideas. <laughs> yeah, I think that like, it sounds like everybody has some issues with leafy greens in particular, um, which are a tough one. Leafy greens are an easy one to feed to worms. The only, I guess the thing is it's expensive. It's an expensive thing to waste. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's it's a problem. It's expensive when you can get a giant tub of spinach from Costco for $3. And this, that amount at Safeway would cost you like $10. You yeah. Know? So you feel like you're like getting a really good deal, but you, I never am able to eat that much. I think that's especially becoming more of an issue right now is people are worried about getting the best value. So they are buying these huge packages of things, but you're not thinking about the fact that it's not really going to have good value. If you throw half of it away, you might've been better off getting the smaller size, even if it was a little bit more per unit or something like that. Because the other thing is, I don't know about you guys, but we have to take our own trash to the dump. So that's another reason for myself to want to reduce my waste is because I don't want to have to haul these stinky bags of trash to the landfill all the time. So I'll just say that magic word again, CSA. There's no plastic bag and you only get like the amount you're going to eat and it's super cheap compared to like going to Safeway. That's awesome. And yeah, and I think it was Jennifer, you were talking about um, opportunities to reduce packaging. And I think really the answer is through those kind of outlets. You need a middleman who is committed to reducing that packaging. Because um, the farmers, you know, they put their stuff in cases. Most of them don't you know, package it down smaller than that. So it's really those middlemen, for the most part, who are making those decisions. So we should all be supporting CSAs. Actually, oh yeah, so I want to be on that call that you guys have about CSAs and you can help me with my CSA fact sheet. This is great. Actually, you know, it would be really cool to at some point in the future in like six months or whatever to touch base with you guys again about maybe what kind of changes you've seen happening and what maybe you've learned from this experience because it sounds like in unexpected ways there have been some upsides for the zero waste movement right now um, it, and it, it might be a nice silver lining to keep in mind that these these are becoming more um, becoming more acceptable and mainstream. Although the reusable bags question is an interesting one. We actually just had that conversation. I think most of the people on this call had that conversation the other day about reusable bags, paper bags or plastic bags. It was a, it was a good discussion. Yeah, there's some, actually, there's a great podcast on it. I want to say it was like Freakonomics or something where they broke it down and said that in, some, in a lot of cases, plastic bags sometimes are, can be better for the environment because they get reused so much. 
Um, so you actually like, you know, you can use them for multiple things, multiple trips to the grocery store. Maybe you put them in your trash can as a bin liner, things like that, versus paper bags are less likely to get reused, maybe easier to spoil. But, you know, case by case basis. Like, a, yeah, I guess you guys, I mean, if it was between like a paper bag and a compostable bag, I would rather go for the paper bag because you could compost it in your backyard versus a compostable bag you might not be able to. Hmm. I use paper bags as liners for trash cans anyway. I just make it fit, shove it in there. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you probably don't waste I, a lot of food then because mine <laughs> just like seeps in and breaks. <laughs> I, I also save the paper bags to put in the bottom of my um, vegetable drawer in the fridge because um, I feel like it uh, keeps the fruits and vegetables um, from spoiling faster. And if they do, it soaks up some of the ew and yeah. yeah, you know, there are a lot of produce items that I think are meant to be stored in brown paper bags for that reason. So I think they say potatoes you're supposed to store in a brown paper bag in a cool, dark place. Um, and apart from onions, onions and potatoes, you're not supposed to store together, things like that. Um, yeah, that's a helpful one. And I, by default, like, I have no idea, I discovered something that um, my husband bought this huge bag of apple bananas and they were all green. And I thought, oh my God, we're never gonna eat that many bananas. And I hung some of them up in the little basket thing. And then I threw the other ones in the bottom of the basket thing, but they were upside down. The upside down bananas did not ripen for like two weeks. So I don't know if that's a thing that well, you guys so know. The ethylene gas is what makes them ripen, and it actually comes out primarily from the cut. So ah. it might have something to do with the distribution of the gas as it comes out. So yeah, when uh, so now I've been doing that. The bananas I don't want to, you know, ripen yet. I put them upside down. That's fascinating. You know, actually, in the mainland, I've seen sometimes they put a little piece of plastic over that um, the part where the top of the hand is cut to prevent it. So I guess you could probably do that too if you had a little piece of a plastic bag and wrapped it over it. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Bananas are a good one. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, one thing I wanted to. This goes way back to talking about food storage. Is because um, you're talking about potatoes. And like there's foods that you're not supposed to store together in a drawer either and ways of keeping certain things also like root vegetables you really shouldn't clean them off either and then so it's it's important to look at these different things like apples and potatoes you don't ever store them together i don't know who outgasses what but there's different things that should be stored together as i mean should not be stored together right yeah and and it's that gas that's responsible for that so tomatoes to put off that gas so like for example actually one thing i've heard my husband grows broccoli and they were always complaining from when their broccoli would be stored with all of these um like bananas or tomatoes and things like that in the same container because they'd be putting all these gases that would make the broccoli go bad faster. So certain things like that, that actually might be an example of when sometimes plastic can be useful. Um, I guess if it's, if it's something like a broccoli that you would wanna protect from those things, putting it in plastic might be helpful. But um, yeah, it depends on your moisture level probably. I did learn from um, running a wildlife rehab center that if you chop up greens and throw one paper towel in with it, that it will stay fresh and crisp longer. And I thought they were crazy when I first started there, <laughs> but, but it turns out they are right. Um, so I do that, but it works. It seems to. But then you're also using paper towel, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's such a that's such a hard balance, and and you guys probably know way more about it than I do. Um, you know, as someone who's really concerned with food safety and shelf life, 
it's yeah it's a real challenge to find zero waste solutions that can can meet those those standards so it's good that you guys have a group where you can figure these things out together and it sounds like csas are the solution to so many of these issues so that's really exciting well you're um, in the group now mariel i'm i'm in i'll be I, i'll be your food waste lady i've got so yeah. much to learn from you guys <laughs> So yeah, and actually uh, I'll probably start offering to give this webinar other places as well. Um, so if you guys have feedback or things you'd like to see added, um, in particular, I would love to hear about what you folks would like to see in the presentation that I didn't cover because I know that you guys are on a different level than most folks who would be introduced to the topic. And it would be great to be able to go a little bit deeper with what you guys are interested in hearing about. Um, like, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are interested in learning more about ways to use food scraps, because that's kind of a whole nother thing. We were talking about making soups with rotisserie chicken and, um, you know, different options like that, that I think you guys are probably thinking about rather than your average person. Um, I would love to be able to address those issues too. So actually like, here. Maybe if you did like a slide of what you store together and what you don't store together, um, just like um, to have it all in one place, kind of. I'm sure it already exists on the internet somewhere. Yeah, that one. The storage is so, every time I looked for an easy guide to storage, the easiest one is like three pages long because there's every food has so many different specifications but there might be some it might be um, it might be possible to like come up with a few examples like potatoes and onions or um, things like that that are just really simple that people would remember like as an example like we'll harvest basil from our herb garden and then i'll just put it in water on the counter and it stays good for like two weeks mm -hmm. herbs and water yeah basil is a really tough one actually because you can't get it wet or it starts to go bad. Mm -hmm. So like if, if you're a farmer growing basil, they won't wash it um, because it can cause the whole thing to, to rot out. When I have a lot of excess basil, I, I do the glass jar with water if I'm gonna use it quickly. But if not, one of the things I found that's really cool with herbs, especially when you have to like cull them down and trim them up is putting them in an ice cube tray with some olive oil and freezing it. Cause then all you have to do is go like when you're making a meal, just pop it into your pan and you already have it all put together. It's brilliant. Then you don't even have to do seasoning. Um, so I guess that's kind of something that I could use help with Marielle is maybe a slide on examples. Like the ideas are great and they're super helpful for me, but I do a lot better when I have specific examples to think of. Sure. Um, yeah. And I could definitely do some work on that. Um, I kept it a little more surface level, but actually what I was just thinking is maybe we could collaborate on putting, like I could put together a little one pager on some of these examples that you guys could then have and share and that sort of thing. I could make it look all pretty if we, you guys have so many great suggestions um, of things that we could like, just little tips for people at home right now who maybe are doing more home cooking than usual and having to deal with food waste more than usual. Um, good uses for that waste. Um, I really love your presentation though. It, it helps me personally think from the behavioral side of it, like, oh, we're, we won't waste if you just make a menu or prep and plan, which never really actually processed until I saw it in your presentation. So thank you. It was yeah, great. Sometimes the really simple stuff, you, it helps to hear it from somebody else. But the other thing I would like to say to you guys is I hope that you're taking it easy on yourselves because you're all superstar zero waste folks. And I think you're already super aware and conscious of these issues in a way that other people aren't. And so it's really inspiring that you guys wanna take this to the next level because that really like when we're talking about inspiring kids and other people to do these things, 
you living the lifestyle you're living is what's going to make that difference. You know, we don't necessarily give ourselves enough credit for how our actions affect, affect other people and make people make different choices because they see the choices that you're making. So I feel like your group is great in that way. Um, you're inspiring people to be better um, through, through even just trying. And you're all human. <laughs> so it's okay if you throw away salad sometimes, especially if you put it in the compost. Um, but thank you again so much for having me here and I'm so glad to be a part of your group and looking forward to ways we can collaborate whether it's on worms or food waste or um, some of these other cool ideas you guys have. Um, can I just add one suggestion? I mean, I sure. Area, but you know, I would love a, a whole webinar specific to food, uh, food planning, you know, because I know, you know, I have a friend who's like, really into it and, and she was kind of breaking it down for me and I was like oh I should really look that up you know that's, what, that's just like one other thing that I have to like search Pinterest about you know I just want somebody to <laughs> no no I get that I'm being, search super Pinterest. <laughs> I'm being super lazy here but I would love for somebody to be like okay this is how I do it ready I these are the you know like you know showing me like okay these are the recipes like I pulled you know and and you know um, this is how I, you know, she has like an app for like, you know, or it's just super meticulous about her list. And then, um, and then with, uh, what is it, with the, you know, and then, yeah, how you said bringing home the food and how she like preps it. Like I, I would love to physically like watch somebody. Uh, yeah. Like, here's I, you know, here's my, my stir fry prep vegetable. Yeah. Ready to get, you know, and she said, you know, she cuts like carrots for this meal and carrots for that meal. I don't know. I just like, you know, super visual. Yeah, and, yeah. Actually, uh, you I'm guys super, probably I'm don't super use... about it at all in general. So I don't actually do the cooking, <laughs> but I'd like to contribute more with the cooking and I would, would more if I planned the meals more. So two things. I would love to put together a webinar on menu planning. That sounds like a great idea. And we're actually coming out with um, a little short publication on this in a little bit. So I could ask my friend who put that out if she wanted to help me put that together. So maybe um, Monica or someone could, we'll find a date, we can set it up and I'll put that together and do your Pinterest searching for you. Um, cause I do think it's important. There's a lot of great information there. You just have to have somebody sift through it. So I volunteer to be that person. <laughs> um, but besides that, um, I do think that, you know, it's possible to get excited about doing menu planning. You can get really into it. It can be a fun activity. Um, one thing that I used to go to is there is a Reddit, a subreddit for meal prep Sunday is what it's called. So meal prep Sunday is this whole thing. It's like a movement of these people who make all of their meals for the week on Sunday. And they take p pictures of all their stuff set out and their little clear airtight containers ready to go for the week. And it gives you ideas. It gets you inspired. You know, they can have links to recipes that you can use to put it together. Um, but yeah, I'm the same way. Seeing people doing it and how they're putting it together can really spur that for you. And sometimes that's really what it takes to get you to try it that first time. Get over the hump, you know of the first time you try something new and start making it more of a habit. This is making my brain like, <laughs> think about like, oh, this whole like webinar platforms that, you know, we can be in people's kitchens, you know? And the oh, fact, yeah. It, but then it's making me think about, oh, well, is there a waste living in general? So I give a tour of their house. Hey, this is how I <laughs> set up my kitchen. You know, this is how I, you know, store my food this is how I, you know, I I'm really liking this idea <laughs> actually you know what so if we when we do this webinar you should tell your friend to be like to be on the call so we could have her have a little time and she could tell us how she does her thing okay I will I will contact her I haven't talked to her in a long time <laughs> but, oh yeah uh, who said Monica says instant pot changed my game too uh that's one that I have to get into you could probably do a whole webinar on oh, instant pot, pot? Cooking. Oh yeah, I would love 
That'd be awesome. <laughs> in, Instant Pot is so easy. It's like you dump it and leave it. It's and you can walk away, go take your dog on a walk. You don't have to like stand yeah. at the stove and like cook and, and monitor things. And it's really changed my whole game, especially with having the courage to start cooking from scratch. Like just make something from scratch. And it's like so much easier that way. Um, and then you realize certain things are better in the Instant Pot than others. Like you can do a whole pork shoulder in 35 minutes. It's like pretty pretty amazing like carnitas um so, so what's yeah. the difference between an instapot and like a crock pot i think crock that's pot. where i get very confused crock pot is a slow cooker so oh, yeah. you cook something like eight it's good in the morning you dump it in the morning and then by the night time but like the instant pot if it's in by five o'clock you're eating by six like like beef stew like stuff like that and I've also heard that you can start, you could put frozen meat into the Instant Pot. And that, because that for me is a game changer. I always have to think ahead if I'm going to cook meat, I have to thaw something out. But if I can just throw it into the Instant Pot frozen, that's such a game changer. I have like uh, a list of like 15 Instant Pot recipes that I've made. We want to create our own um, like, like a cookbook which is kind of like an idea we had. We had a meeting about that like in December, but we could totally have that be a part of it too. For sure. I love all these ideas and I'm getting, I'm, I'm really looking for opportunities to do education and produce materials around all of these new kitchen habits. So this is all super perfect. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, Muriel, for doing this. We totally loved it. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Happy to be here. Happy to be involved in the future. So let me know when you want to do that menu planning webinar and I'll start working on it. Looking forward to it. I dig it. I'm totally free. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right, cool. Well, this is really fun. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh, hi, everyone. So good to see everybody. You. Yeah, you too. Take, take care. Even if it is digital, it's great. <laughs> yeah. <Bye. laughs>